Professor Henry Markram. Good afternoon. So the Human Brain Project is a, a very large multidisciplinary project involving neuroscientists, physicists, statisticians, informaticians, uh, very broad ethicists, uh, with uh, a goal of bringing a focus to the human brain. And in general, the goal is to help unify our understanding of the human brain. But just to avoid misunderstanding, it's not that the members of the consortium of the Human Brain Project are going to understand the human brain or unify the understanding of the human brain. Our goal is to build the technology that we believe is missing that will help the world understand the human brain or reach a unified understanding of the human brain. So, how would you approach, what do you need if you want to unify our understanding of the human brain. It just so there are a number of activities that are needed, and this is perhaps the best way. It's always very difficult to explain such a project. But the first is that, as Bruno mentioned in the beginning, we need to be aware that there's a huge activity of neuroscience, global. It's a global activity. And we need that individual discovery science. And I'm going to go through each of these in a second. We need more systematic mapping of the brain. And we're seeing that emerge with the different uh, national brain initiatives. We need to organize that data. We need to database and make it accessible to everybody. We need to put the data together somehow. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And I think the other critical new feature that we need is we need to learn how to work as teams in the way NASA gets together to launch a space shuttle. We're going to need to get together and bring many disciplines together to understand a protein or a disease. We need to advance supercomputing enormously to make it suitable for our challenges. Supercomputing has traditionally been driven by many other needs, such as nuclear physics or astrophysics or engineering, and we need to make it suitable for life science and neuroscience in particular. I think it's crucial that we bring industry into the game. Industry is a very powerful engine, and when they see certain value out of it, they can bring resources that are unmatched compared to what the public resources can bring. And then lastly, we need to bring the public with us on the journey of understanding the brain. So if we look at individual research, it is truly a global enterprise. Bruno said 10,000 labs. Actually, when you go to the Society for Neuroscience meeting, there are about 40,000, 50,000 participants. Huge number of posters. Um, there are probably around 100,000 neuroscientists around the world that are individually digging into their particular corner of the brain in a different species, at a different age, with different genetic variations, different diseases. And you can see on the map there, this is just a, a sense of all the nations, all the activity that is happening around the world in the brain. If you include the medical research, it's about another 100,000. So about 200,000 researchers uh, generating the knowledge. And this is the, no the source of the knowledge of the brain, but in fragmented, in a way that's uncoordinated, in a way that we don't have any tools and technology to bring it together. We don't even have tools to share it. We use papers today or books but we need to get much more sophisticated about how to bring that data together. And this is one of the key goals in the Human Brain Project, is building the technology for data sharing so that that knowledge and data doesn't get lost, but lives forever in some form in databases or in models or in other forms that they can be useful. So the second thing that is obviously needed is much more systematic data. The individual researchers generate data with their own standards, their own approaches, methods, and techniques, which are all fantastic, and they produce a huge amount of knowledge. But the data itself is not systematic and not standardized. 
And that doesn't matter because what one needs on top of that is another layer, framework of maps of the brain. Now, the, you will hear from Christoph Koch, which is the pioneer. The Allen Institute has pioneered how to industrially map the brain. And this has been an incredible catalyst, I think, to all of neuroscience. It was received in the beginning by neuroscientists as, oh, no, we've got to do the individual research. But these global maps serve as a framework, a scaffold, where others can connect to, can compare their data to, do not have to study the distribution of the protein across all the brains, across the entire brain or different brains. So we need many maps. But as you'll see, you could map the brain for a very, very long time because there's so many different ways that you could map the brain. There's 20,000 genes, they express in many different ways. There are, there are about 20,000, uh, 2,000 to 20,000 different proteins in one neuron. You have 190 or billion pro uh, uh, neurons uh, in the brain. You have about 1,000 trillion synapses. You could map the brain in many different ways. And so we have to begin, so we provide the scaffold for us. But it's not sufficient. We have to develop the tools and the technologies that these maps can serve as anchors so that the data and the knowledge can be put into these maps so that we understand where we all fit in to this global enterprise. And the INCF has pioneered this, and in fact it was started in the 1990s by what was called the US Human Brain Project by Bill Clinton. And uh, for about 10 years they really drove the culture of databasing the brain, de developing the technologies to mine and understand the brain. It was taken over by an OECD organization called the INCF, which is really trying to establish standards, uh, mining technology, clustering data, uh, the data to look for patterns in the data, and make the data generally accessible. We also have to access data that, is, uh, that are in hospitals all around the world. There are millions of patients that have been <coughs> measured and scanned. And this data just sits there. It's not data that is currently being used to help us understand brain diseases. And so this is one of the key technologies that the Human Brain Project will build to try to help that we can bring all of this data together in a meaningful way. Well, you can database the brain, you can get all the data and the knowledge, but ultimate, an ultimate test is if you can put it together. And we believe that reconstructing and simulating the brain is one method to be able to see whether it all fits, whether it, the data that we generate makes sense. And there are actually three reasons why uh, reconstructing and simulating is a missing technology and a key technology, and we believe that we can't get towards a unified understanding without it, is firstly because you need a technology to put all of this together. You know, in the 17th century, the cartographers started to try to build a map of the world, and they had to take maps from every sailor that went around the world, and they had laid them out and they had to try to integrate them. And when you do that, you discover that things fit. Many people report the same island as in a particular place, and things don't fit. And it's important to know what doesn't fit as well. But you also discover big gaps in the knowledge, which is also very important. So you can see holes. And we also know that these maps never end because we always get them more and more detailed. Even today, the map of the world continues to refine. But we need a place where we can integrate these systematically. The second important reason is that we need to test our hypotheses. We need a way to test an idea that we have. It doesn't help that we just wait for it to be repeated, which it may not be. Neuroscience is facing a huge reproducibility problem. About 75% of experiments are never reproduced. So this is a way that we can test the hypotheses and see if our understanding is correct. The third and perhaps the most important reason why brain simulation is key in part of the missing technology that we need is that the brain is like the universe. We are not going to map everything in every stage of development and all genetic variations and genders and 
over 600 different diseases and in different species, we're not going to get all of those maps for every dimension of a genetic and protein and cells and synapses and circuits. And what we have to be able to do is to look at the principles, our understanding, and produce predictive maps. Most of the universe will not be measured, but today you can use prediction, you can use the knowledge, build predictions, and you can come up with simulations that do predict the evolution of the universe, the evolution of a galaxy. So we believe that this technology is needed to help us. It is not an answer, but it's needed to help us unify our understanding of the brain. The, the, egg, the next technology we think is missing and key is that we actually have to realize that it's probably going to take not one, but hundreds of Einsteins to understand the brain. And to do that, we need to build NASA workstations. But this is not one NASA workstation. This could be thousands of NASA works, workstations. You need teams, a team of scientists to understand a neuron. You need a cell biologist and a biophysicist and a geneticist and an electrophysiologist and a theoretician, a mathematician, just to understand one neuron. And what we are building in the Human Brain Project are what are called collaboratories. Collaboratories are where teams of scientists will be able to come together in virtual space from anywhere in the world and actually attack a problem, attack a disease. And so this technology is what we're going to be developing and deploying it actually very soon and it will be tested by the consortium until the middle of next year and then it will be open to the world to use and to try and to give their feedback. Um, so, of course, as I mentioned, there are other things. We need to adapt supercomputers so that they can simulate and model the brain or use very detailed biophysical processes, eventually model nutrition. How is the brain served by all the environment around it? That requires major innovation in computing and it may be that the conventional computers are not good enough. And so we are also driving neuromorphic computing and I think tomorrow you'll hear from Karl-Heinz Meyer on the new kinds of computers that could, we could build by learning from the brain to build computers that will help us understand the brain. And uh, we, of course, need to drive commercialization so that we bring in industry and we are creating a concept called innovation hubs where industry will be able to sit together and present their cases, their challenges, and we will discuss together with the scientists how we can actually address those challenges. And then lastly, we are starting a public dissemination strategy where we will work with 3,500 science museums around the world to disseminate knowledge of the brain and its diseases and the kind of technologies that can be built. But this is not just for the Human Brain Project. Our goal is that this science center will actually disseminate knowledge of activity in all the international initiatives, in the China Brain Initiative, the US Brain Initiative, Canadian Brain Initiative, Israel Brain Initiative. So it will serve as, a, as, a, as an outlet for this, so that there could be a way for the public to actually go on this voyage of the brain with all of us. And we think that that's absolutely key, because it may be that the climate has to be right for us to understand the brain, the worldwide climate not just an individual scientist. Basically, we don't believe that you can understand this in an island all by yourself. It has to be an entire adventure of humanity. So the consortium, this is the initial consortium, but as I said, from month 30, which is the middle of next year, the project actually opens up and we're hoping that this will become a global collaboration of thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, perhaps all of neuroscience, as well as the engineering and physicists around the world. And the last comment that I want to make is that it is a beginning. It's not an ending, as Patrick mentioned. This is something that we begin a voyage, but it's a determination towards a unifying understanding. There will always be something that we don't understand about the brain. But if we do not begin and we do not have the determination to take the risks required to begin, we will not understand the human brain. Thank you very much.